So I just wanted to talk to you today about um, what we're doing in Australia. I come from a province, the province of Victoria, which is at the bottom of Australia. You can see that little circle there. And I just wanted you to know that we're a long way away. It took me a long time to get here. Uh, the other thing about Australia is that we're sort of opposite with climate. Um, this is uh, looking at the beach. Uh, Australia, all the big cities are on the coast. This is last a couple of summers ago, looking at the beach. The dust from the middle of the country went out into the ocean. It came back on the beach, on the shores. The temperatures were around about 45, 50 in the middle. And on the outside, in the cities, it was still between 30 and 42. So Australia is very hot. Um, the general population of Australia, in 2014, in March, we had um, two th 23, uh, 23 million people. Uh, natural growth is about 40%. And the rest of our country, our fellow men, come from, um, they migrate to Australia. There's a slowing growth in some of the big states in uh, Australia. Um, and the net migration, most of the people who migrate to Australia are coming to New South Wales, which is where Sydney is, and Victoria. 70% um, of the population, as I think I mentioned, live in the cities. When you look at the different population break breakdown between state and territories, there are two territories in Australia, the Northern Territory and also the Australian Capital, um, which is the Australian Capital Territory. And there, so there are six states and two territories. So just a little bit about each of them. New South Wales has Sydney and the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is very beautiful. Uh, five million um, of the 7.4 million in New South Wales live in Sydney. In Victoria, we have four million plus out of a population of 5.7. In Queensland, the growth is slowing, but it's still 4.6 million. In South Australia, uh, 1.6. It's a wine growing district. Uh, in Queensland, we have all those big cattle stations that you've probably seen in the movies. Um, in Tasmania, it's a very, very small country at the bottom of Australia. We often forget to mention it, but the other day when Tony Abbott, our Prime Minister, who is a friend of Stephen Harper, was having dinner with the Chinese Prime Minister, he, th he said, it is so good to have the Prime Minister of Australia and the Prime Minister of Tasmania here to have dinner together. <laughs> so, so only occasionally do we remember Tasmania, but we remember it on this particular occasion. Actually, Tony Abbott remembered. So that's uh, good in one way, I guess, but sad for China. Um, the Northern Territory has quite a small population, but has the greatest proportion of uh, Aboriginal children. So our First Nation people uh, are very important to us in Northern Territory, and some of the issues that we have there are the same as you have, as we'll discuss later. The Australian Capital Territory is mostly bureaucrats living in Canberra, about 380,000 people. The Australian Early Development Census was renamed when the new Conservative government came in at the end of last year, at the beginning of, uh, uh, the beginning of this year. And so it used to be the EDI, now it's called the AEDC, but it's the same as your EQDEM. The funding for the EDI is provided by the Australian government. So they federally fund the entire country every two years to collect the data for the EDI, which is fantastic. So we've done two federally funded Australia-wide collections in 2009 and 2012. In 2009, it was about 270,000 children we collected data from in their first year of school. And in 2012, it was more like 280,000 children. So we have a lot of data on children in their first year of school. Um, the cost for implementation across the country is around about $29 million for every three-year cycle. Most of that money is to pay the teachers to fill in the AEDC or the EDI. But the rest of the money, and every state and territory is given a small amount of money over three years to actually use the data and promote the use of the data within the province. And this is really, really important. Um, and the, one of the things that we have done in Victoria, which is um, one province, uh, is that we've been able to actually use that, data, use that money to do some interesting things with local communities. And um, I'll talk to you mostly about that in my talk, mostly later on when I talk about uh, community action. So Australia is uh, ranked, uh, you know, in the middle third, in the middle or the bottom third of the OECD um, data that's collected ac across the world. And we're very worried about that. We're a little bit below Canada. And uh, Australia didn't like that. And so what they've done is they introduced the EDI and they introduced it across Australia. So we use the EDI as a progress measure of how well children are doing across the country. And we collect it every three years. And we have a three-year political cycle. Um, the NEST Action Agenda is a, an agenda that was developed as a result of having children not doing so well in Australia. We want to bring them up. 
We want to compete with the other countries like Finland and others, and we want to do better for our children. We're a wealthy nation, just like Alberta is a wealthy province. I spoke to Lynn before. And um, so they started, the, um, they started this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, um, arrangement with uh, representatives for all state, from all states and territories, from the research, from government, from uh, communities and from non-for-profits. And basically, the um, ERACI, which is the group that I belong to and I represent Victoria, um, developed a vision that all children are loved and safe and have basic material needs. I'm sure you all know this sort of picture. You have those in your own documents. The other thing um, that we, are very, we talk about a lot is we talk about the child at the centre, we talk about the child and the family at the centre, and it doesn't matter which um, document, which diagram you look at, it's all pretty much the same. But if you want to improve outcomes for children, clearly you need to have um, families who can support them and communities that can support them. So this is well understood. And the pictures that you had on brain development, we use those pictures all the time and we talk about how there's a lot of activity around um, birth and we talk about how the activity comes back in adolescence and there's a lot of correlation between what's happening at five and what's happening in adolescence. So people are um, thinking now that we need to actually think about outcomes for children and this is particularly in early childhood, that if you're working in early childhood, you need to start thinking about outcomes for children, not only at five years old and when they go to school. Clearly, transition is important. But you need to think about them staying at school, finishing school, being able to be wholesome, aware, and important people in their children's lives. So the priority directions, I'm sure, are not unlike yours. And we have an agenda, which is 0 to 25. And some people call it the first quarter. The data came in, the data, we started talking about turning data into action back in 2007 and they, uh, we had a Prime Minister who was there for a couple of years, Kevin 07, we used to call him because he was elected in 2007. And um, he, that, they, that was when they decided to do the ADC across Australia. So it started in 2007, 2009 was the first implementation and in 2011 the results came out. And so in Victoria, which is, is a state, and I, I must um, declare, I, um, I run the EDC, EDA, EDI project in Victoria. I sit on the national committees um, uh, for the um, EDI and I work with the Australian Research Alliance. So I work in a number of different spaces and um, I spend some, time, some of my time visiting other communities throughout Australia to see what they're doing compared to what we're doing. Um, but in Victoria, it's been quite progressive, and there are a number of reasons um, that support the progress, which um, I'll explain later. So in 2011, when the first data came out, we actually decided to work very closely with communities. In Victoria, we have a Municipal Association of Victoria, so all local government areas are um, part of this Municipal Association. And so we have 80 local government areas and they all hold administrative data. They all hold data sets of their own. We also um, have, the, we have a big maternal and child health service and the maternal and child health service, which uh, the nurses are employed with half the money from the Victorian state government and half the money from the local government, we have about seven or 800 maternal and child health nurses who do assessments on children from six weeks to three and a half years old. So we have a lot of um, movement between local government and state government and also between state government and federal government with the EDI. Um, I'm going to talk to you at the end of this about what we're actually going to do next, but in the meantime, I'm going to take you to how we got to where we are now. So you know the domains of the ADC or the EDI, um, and these are the results from 2009 and 2012. I'm not going to talk about the data analysis. Martin Goon, he'll speak to you later, he's very good at that and he's an expert. He can talk to you about the data and um, how, the impact it's had and what people are doing. But I just wanted to give you an overall picture of what's actually happening here in Australia, or there in Australia. So if you look at the 2009-2012 results, you can see that when you're looking at vulnerability on one domain, the national score was 23.6, moved to 22. When you look at the um, First Nation people, um, the Indigenous developmental vulnerability you can see is much, much higher. That's not a surprise to any of you here. But the important thing to understand is that we collect information on all our children. We don't um, differentiate and we collect uh, we go out into remote communities and we have teachers fill in the data. We have cultural consultants who sit next to the teacher in those communities and they um, validate the actual um, questions, responses. We do find vulnerability higher in boys uh, than girls, 
But in many of the studies that we're doing at the same time, and I work um, on a, a, a Centre for Research Excellence in Speech, Language and Communication, um, I'm on one of the participants of that, we know that children who are diagnosed at two and four, as many of you who are speech pathologists or linguists in the room will know, that those children, when they get to age eight, seven, it starts to flatten out, and boys aren't doing much worse than girls. Obviously, by the time they get to 27, they seem to be earning a hell of a lot more money. Um, so the Victorian <laughs> context. So one of the good things that happened was the Victorian um, early uh, government decided to bring early childhood and education together. So that was all the 700, 800 maternal and child health nurses, the 300 school nurses, all the school support services, all those who work in education and all those who work in early childhood education and care together in one department. It was very difficult at the beginning but it's been a major win because people have to speak to each other. We're, we are now even in the same building, we're not across the road in the little building, we're in the big building. And my position, I sit in the policy and strategy area, so I report through to the executive across that area, and it's a very good position to be in because I have a lot of flexibility to come in and out of the gov government offices, I have a lot of uh, flexibility, I work a lot with communities, and it brings a, a place for communities to the table. The, but the aim was to bring everyone together, and we've done that quite well, I think, now. It doesn't, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, the other thing, um, I've spoken to a few of you about this, is that we, back in 2004, we developed a Victorian um, child and adolescent outcomes framework. So all the work we do now, we focus on the outcomes, we work, we work to uh, uh, achieve those outcomes. And um, this was, uh, came about as a result of legislation in the, from the Victorian government, which meant that every department had to rep be re represented on a services coordination board. So we have education, family services, welfare, everybody, education, health, et cetera, et cetera, all sitting on a children's coordination board. And they endorsed the development and implementation of the Victorian Child and Adolescent Outcomes Framework. This is very important because when people look at their EDI results, they can then go through a portal to the um, VCAMS, as they call it, and pick up the results that are complementary to the EDI results. So there's a number of things that have happened. We've talked about, if we start left and move uh, down, you can see that um, we sit below Canada on, in terms of the, uh, you know, the OECD um, results. Um, but the, the one sitting down below, the, the B, we need to break the cycle of disadvantage. What this tells you, and I have this slide again later on, is that there is a big intervention when children turn five. And that big intervention is school. And school costs a lot of money. And so the argument is that if you bring things forward and you start earlier, you may have better results. When you look at the, um, C, which is up here on the right-hand side, you can see that there is a gap in the investment. Um, between the ages of about one and three, we don't invest so much. Um, and obviously, there's an expectation from government to improve outcomes. We can talk about that um, some other time. But Victoria, I suppose, very early, in the, very early in the piece, decided to make a real effort to use the EDI. And so we started with the data collection. We moved to sharing the data, which was the talks and um, provide, providing products. We started looking at what had been successful in, in, interventions as a result of having good data. We then moved into the next part, was looking at the data integration, bringing the EDI results together with those that were from, from the Victorian Child and Adolescent Monitoring System. If you have lots of administrative data sets across Victoria or across a state or across a country, bring them together as much as possible so you have complementary data. Then we had to start thinking about building communication. So we actually found, as I walked around the country and I met people, People would volunteer. They wanted to be local champions. And so what, they're not paid local champions. What they are is they're volunteers, but they're people who represent their community. And what I can do for them is bring them into government policy discussions. I can go back out to them and share data with them. We have um, a few people who can do this, but we have a bunch of about 240 local champions in the state of Victoria who've put up their hand and we provide as much opportunity as possible for them to meet other people from other states and territories so they can actually see how well they're doing in comparison to them. The most important thing is that we, we, we link results of the data and the evidence which is provided to successful interventions. And so as time's gone by, we've been able to gain, um, I suppose, um, acknowledgement as a preeminent data set. 
So the EDI has become extremely important. This was very important for us to do early in the piece. And I think in Victoria there'd been a lot of work that came before so we could actually push this forward as quickly as possible and as hard as possible because we knew if there was a change of government they may take the funding away from having the EDI done every three years, as always happens. So it became such a strong data set that when the Conservative government came in, all they could really do was change the name from the AEDI to the AEDC. It's now a census, not an instrument or an index, and that's good. The ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, love it. And they're now on the National Committee and they sit next to me and it, they, they love it being called a census because it actually gives it something that they can hold on to and they can push as well. Um, we also have... Um, in our data analysis, we've been able to compare our 2006 census with a complete 2011 census, so we've been a little luckier than you, which has been very helpful, and the ABS have been very involved in that. The idea is that we have greater evidence-based uh, local planning and decision-making, and we also, it's very important that we get that information and that work that's being done across to government. And when I go back to government and they tell me, what are we going to do, what can we do, I say to them, you know, and many of us say, you need to develop strong policy. Not policy which is linked to um, providing feedback every two weeks against these categories, or you can only get this money if you do A, B, C and D. So the whole bunch of work that we're doing, um, bunch is probably not a word that you would use, but the whole lot of work that we do is based around policies, partnership and evidence to improve. This is my niece, I'm one of eight. Um, I'm the eldest and I have many children in my, my life. I always have had. They've all gone away now instead of disappearing. I have to go and find some more. But um, <laughs> I always bring these kids into the, into the conversation because it's important to think about the child in your life. So that's Maggie. So we, when we went out to the, to the communities, we started to provide them with information. So we tried to provide it in many different ways. So this was one way of presenting data. This was another way of presenting data. We developed a website. We actually provided maps. In these maps we actually show colours. The red is the most disadvantaged and the dark blue is the least advantaged and those little um, triangles actually represent schools. So we try and map information on top of maps so people can see where the growth areas are, where the schools are, where the services are, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we need the features of interest overlaid on the mapped data layers. So as much we get as much data as possible that we provide to communities with the EDI data so they can see how they're doing. Um, this has been the most important thing, tool that we've had in terms of actually showing communities how well their children are doing. Because we do this with all the data, whether it be employment or housing or family violence, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We show them the colours. And if you look at one domain, we call it develop DV1. So developmental vulnerability on one domain, it looks like that. DV2 looks like this. Physical health and wellbeing looks like this. Emotional maturity looks like this and so on and so <coughs> forth. So the mapping is really important and people can see where the common elements are. They can see what they need to pay attention to in their, in their local area. We also started doing bubble plots so we could actually show the distribution. So it wasn't just the disadvantaged areas where children are not doing well. Um, it's the proportion of children who aren't doing well. This was the 2009 with the 2012 overlay. People are constantly looking at ways of actually showing how well children are doing and looking at um, the fact that we have to provide that proportionate universal approach. We actually have to provide services to all children on a gradient and provide more intense services for children who are doing less well. And this is another way of representing this data. So the, the concept of progressive universalism has been picked up all across Australia. So we're, I suppose in all the service provision and planning and policy that we write and do, we're trying to actually incorporate all children, clearly focusing on children uh, where there is less um, advantage and who are doing more poorly. But it's important that children who are doing poorly have somewhere to go when they're doing better. And this, of course, is that slide about uh, intervention of school. This is Maggie on your right-hand side with her cousin, who is my son, who is a bit later. And what I suppose one of the things that we talk about all the time is understanding the scaffolding. If the, if the predictive validity of the EDI is so good and you can tell how well children are going to be doing at the age of five, why the hell aren't we doing more than we're doing? Some of the communities are doing things like developing children's report. This was a report that was done by the state of Bendigo. And what they did was they chose 20 indicators to show the status of their children. One indicator was children developing well and they use the EDI. The tenth indicator was children and young people are achieving at school. 
and they had another 18 indicators which actually looked at complementary data. They did this, and when they did the second um, status report, they did the status report in this one, then they did a plan, and then they did a st second status report. When they did their second status report, what they found was that the children were not necessarily doing better. And that's an important thing to remember. You just can't develop one population of uh, uh, the environment that affects children and expect everything to change. It has to be across the whole population. And this was really important. It was discouraging in some ways. When I went to Bendigo and we talked about why they weren't doing very well, they said the factory closed down. You know, two to 300 to 400 people over time lost their jobs. Family violence went up, child protection went up out-of-home care went up. There were lots of things that were affected by many different things. So the idea now is to bring data and knowledge to action. So you need to build the evidence base, you need to understand the context, we need to do it together, and many people this morning talked about how you do that. You need to build on interim success. Don't bring in a new governance structure, don't bring in a new partnership. Look at what's working within a community at the moment. But have a governance which has some authority, some people who can actually make decisions and give you some money. You need to define who you are in the implementation, but also you need to evaluate and then you start again. So we are now at the point, and this is um, <clears throat> a bit of a test that we're doing at the moment, we're actually trying to look at where, children, where communities sit on a continuum. So together with some people from out of my own home state and with some consultants who are working as advisors to government and non-for-profits, et cetera, we're going to the 80 local communities and we're trying to work out where they sit. Are they at the beginning where they're doing nothing with the data? I suspect there might be one out of 80. Are they at the end where there's community acceptance through the work that's being done and the declaration of how well the children and young people are doing? And who's stuck in the middle? Are there some who are stuck in the middle because they can't get out of their own way? Are they fighting with each other about who leads the work? Or are they just on the way up? to being more advanced. And so this is what we're trying to do, is to work at where communities sit. And, and when I say we, I, I'm one person in a, bunch, in a group of others who are actually trying to plot out where people sit. And the reason for doing this is that depending on where you sit on the continuum uh, defines to some extent the strategies that you might need to actually uh, change your systems. So we have an X and a Y axis, we have the readiness for change, the scale on the y-axis, and we have where a community sits on the continuum, and we're plotting them out. And this way we would hope that communities can come together and they can advise each other about how they're going to actually improve outcomes for children. As you know, we don't um, ever do this work on our own. Um, we don't have 10 employed people, we don't give $50,000 to each community. We actually rely on people to come forward and use funding that they've got and we work together as much as we possibly can. But you actually have to have a bunch of people who are working together to support those who are on the community, but also support those who are in the department and in government. And so you need someone who takes the messages backwards and forwards. Uh, you need someone who can actually give you the do the analysis. In the early days of the EDI implementation in Australia, we didn't have enough nerdy people and that was a real problem for us. You have to have good data. I was the one who found out that the data analysis wasn't strong. I would be the one who would find out that it didn't match up with what the communities knew. You need to have really good data analysis. You need very good analytical analytic people. And Joyce Cleary is someone that I work with who is very, very strong. She runs the Victorian Child and Adolescent Monitoring System and the outcomes work. Megan Harper is, exception, is an exceptional geospatial cartographer. She is fantastic. I, I introduced her by Skype the other day to the, to the people at um, Health, and I hope to get her out here to look at what people are doing with their mapping here. You give her XY coordinates and she layers data upon layer. It's fantastic. And you need people who are completely committed to the implementation, who write the documents, and who do it well. So um, that's all I have to say. Um, there's, I've got lots to say, actually. But, you know, that's enough for today. And um, I'm sorry I don't speak French, but uh, and, and good luck with my accent. Thank you. Thank you.